first task, and we're going to divide this, uh, this teaching tonight, this sermon tonight, in, into two parts. <clears throat> My part is talking about the body of Christ. And then we're going to take um, the bread as the body of Christ, and then uh, we'll sing a song, and then George will come up and uh, talk about the blood and wherever else you want to go. Amen. <laughs> But the, the body of Christ, Luke 22, uh, verses 7 through 20. Luke 22, verses 7 through 20 is where we're going to start this evening in this short devotional. And um, I thought about this, uh, um, dividing these two things, because um, we don't necessarily, we, we focus on the body, but when we usually say the body as Christians, we're talking about the body of Christ. You know, we're talking about the body of Christ, but I want to talk about the physical body of Jesus Christ, our Savior, so we can understand that more. We've been kind of doing elements. Um, last, uh, this last Sunday, I, I spoke about, about Palm Sunday and the palms, and I think it's very important for us to understand why we do what we do as Christians, especially so we can pass it down to the generations. Amen? So today we'll talk about the bread and the blood. Luke 22, verses 7 through 20, I will read in your hearing. Now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. That's what's happening right now. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Remember, said, Jesus said last, last, uh, this last Sunday, go and um, get me an animal to ride on, right? So Jesus is always, and they're looking at him like, okay, are these people? Don't worry about it. Just go and do what I tell you to do. You know? I love that about Jesus. Verse 9, where do you want us to prepare it? They're all nervous. They asked him. He replied, Okay, guys, as soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owners, the teacher, I love that, rabbi, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. They went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. I'm like, Jesus, he's amazing, you know? Verse 14, when the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. This is the Passover meal. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. I love that, the kingdom of God. We know that the kingdom of God is right now. It's happening right now. We are part of that kingdom. Verse 19, here's our main verse. He took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is given up for you, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and said, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. We're focusing on the bread, the physical body of Christ. It is something that we rarely talk about, as I said, in the church. We don't even have that many songs about the body of Christ. So we, we looked, didn't we, Mom? <laughs> and, you know, we, we like to think that we are hymnal people. We know the hymns of the church. Um, it is amazing, though, when you think about the suffering that God, Jesus, endured for us, the suffering that he went through 
for us, like the song says, just for me. He came in human form, okay? That was just a huge sacrifice from being worshipped by angels in heaven next to the Father. Can you imagine? Okay, yeah, I'm going to go down there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> really? You, we're going to do this. Yes, we're going to do this. Okay. And then he lived in human form. If being born was enough, he, he lived the life. And then he died the most brutal death that anybody could endure, the most torturous human death by the, the government of that time, by the Roman government. All for us. All for us. That is what he wants us to remember. This is what he wants us to remember. In remembrance of me, do these things. He, he does not want us to take his suffering for granted. You know, oh, Jesus died. Okay, great. No, that's not it. Some may say, you know, Jesus Christ was kind of, you know, he's kind of, um, what, what, what is the word, uh, self-absorbed or something. Remember me. They, they take it out of context. But he's not doing that for himself like he wants to be remembered, like he's a, a superstar. No. He's saying, remember me. This is good for you. This is what I did for you. So telling us to remember him is a benefit for us. And Jesus did that. He turned it around every time. He, he, he was like that. He was kind of mystical and just out of the box, you know, talking to everybody, the Pharisees, you know, his disciples, the crowds, talking to God, you know, being led. When we think of Christ, we always think of him as the lion, and we also need to think of him as the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. It was God's plan from the beginning that Jesus would die for us. Revelation 13, 8 says this in LT, and all the people who belong to this world worship the beast. Now, we're in a scene where the, where the beast is in control, the Antichrist, right? And he's, this is at the end of the book. But look further in verse 8. There are the ones whose name were not written in the book of life that belong to the lamb, who's Jesus, who was, there it is, slaughtered before the world was made, slain from the foundations of the world. In the, in the brief time that we have, I, I just wanted to refer to some of the, the physical, the physicalness of, of Jesus' sufferings. It is maybe a little bit harsh, but I just want to concentrate because that is what talks about the body of Christ, the, the physical body of Christ. You see, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The Godhead made the decision that Jesus would come down to earth, and Jesus gladly accepted this role. Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says this, though he was God, okay, he was God, he was right there in heaven, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He didn't want to hold on to that. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a, what? A slave. And was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus freely gave of his body for me, for us. It was something that wasn't forced on him. The father didn't say, okay, go down there and do it. Jesus said, you're thinking what I'm thinking, Father. Yeah? Holy Spirit, you agree? Yeah, yeah, let's go here. Let's, let's, let's save this world. It's very hard to do. He gave up his godly role to be with us, suffering the things that we suffer. Listen to this. Suffering the things that we suffer, everything that we suffer, that we go through, aching body and all, and all these things, Jesus took it on his body to do this. He was tempted in every way that we are tempted. That is interesting. You, don't, you see Jesus 
um, when he's a young man, maybe um, right out of Egypt, and then there's a whole section missing. And, and this place where something happens to Joseph, we, we mostly think Joseph passed and died, and, and then he had to go through this whole thing until he gets to age 30, and John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, right? So we miss this whole adolescent thing. He's there. He's teaching in the temple and stuff like that. And people are like, this, this, is, this cat is, wow, amazing. But we skip this whole section of Jesus' life until age 30. And it says that he was tempted. Who knows what that, those temptations are? We know the big temptation where he is out there with Satan, right? But what happened? We don't know. We'll have to find out when we meet him, huh? Hebrews 4.15, it says, The high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. Amazing. He died a brutal death. A body was given for us, and he wants us to remember. What are we to remember? Let's give some specifics here. Remember, he had been through an emotional and physical stress in the garden prayer right before he went to the cross, sweating great drops of blood. His body, his body. Jesus was struck in the face before Ananias. Struck, just beat up. Jesus was before Caiaphas, <clears throat> the Sanhedrin. Caiaphas. Ah! K-I-F-U-S. Caiaphas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gosh, Caiaphas. <laughs> you know I practice that. And when I get to the word, I always mess it up. Caiaphas. I said Sanhedrin right, you see. And he was beaten by soldiers. Okay? Professional beaten. This is not just a, you know, again, hey, you guys come over here and beat you. No, these are professionals. They know how to beat people. He was blindfolded, he was spat upon, he was mocked and beaten again. Jesus may have been cuts with bruises, teeth missing. And then, after that, Pilate sought to appease the religious leaders by agreeing, agreeing to have Jesus flogged and crucified. Flogged, what does that mean? Now, a lot of you guys, you, you know this, because you, you've... You've um, experienced this, and not experienced it on yourself, but you've, you've taught it. <laughs> you've taught it, and you've heard about it. But let me just give you a picture again. The flagrum, a whip, braided with bones and metals and fragments tied along its length. Whipped and then pulled back in order to rip the flesh off of the back of a person. So Jesus was stood up. This is after all this stuff. He stood up on a pole of some sort and was whipped 39 times. Not 40 because 40 is the sign of judgment, right? 39. Ooh. Back is open. Not to mention anywhere else these two men, one or two men, whipped him. And then the soldiers mocked him. You had professional people that beat you up, and now you're turned over to the Roman soldiers, and they are professionals as well. Put a robe on him, give him a wooden staff, maybe take that staff out of him, beat him with it a little bit, make him spend the night there or a few hours while they do whatever they want to with our Savior, his body. And then they placed a thorn of crown, a, a, a crown of thorns on his head with thistles, you know, huge. And then they made him carry his cross. He was so, he was just so worn out that he had to have somebody else carry it for him. He was forced to carry it for Jesus. Then they take him to the cross. They have this wooden cross and nail him to it and then post him up for everyone to see and continue to be mocked. 
while his mother and John stood there and while the other disciples have fled, left alone. It is hard to hear that, isn't it? It was hard for me to write this. But that's just a little bit of the story. When he dies and then he rises again. Amen? He dies, he's put in a tomb and he bust out that tomb. I like you to say bust out, you know. He bust out that tomb. Death couldn't hold him down. This is what Jesus wants us to remember. And we do. We remember this for his sake. Well, I get to be home for a little bit with you guys. This is, this is nice to be here. And uh, it's so good what's going on here. And Captain's Wheel folk, we bring our greetings. We're so thrilled and thankful that we got to be part of you for a while and you kind of transplanted us into what we're doing now and things are things are good things are well so thank you and uh, I'll just share a couple thoughts with you about the blood about an hour and a half ago the night unlike any other night has begun sundown the candles were lit and the questions began, four of them, asked by the youngest. Why? Why is this a night like any other night? Why do we do these things? And the story is told. And in the telling, we are brought in to the story. Story becomes our story. It becomes a feast a feast of unleavened bread because we're in a hurry. We gotta get out of town. You know, there's some folks breathing down our necks. And they ain't, they ain't good folks. They don't get it, this God that we worship. Well, here's the feast, which becomes the Lord's Supper. Bread, wine, body, and blood. What a mess. Christianity is a messy religion. <laughs> good, good thing we have a God that cleans up messes. Huh? But herein, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And life is in that blood. Wine is poured out. It's poured out with a promise, a covenant. In the Middle East, that's how deals were done. Way before President Trump, there were cutting deals. These were how covenants were cut. Hmm. Yeah, these are how they were signed and sealed and delivered. They take an animal and they cut it in half. And they put one part of the animal over here and one part over here. And then the covenant terms were spoken of by the two parties who came in between them. This animal could be a sheep or a goat, most likely a sheep, a lamb maybe, cut in two, placed side by side, and there they were speaking to the two who were making a covenant. Two parties walking between the terms agreed upon, the promises made, and oh, if you didn't keep your end of the deal, see those animals? That's what might happen to you. <laughs> we think a horse in a bed with a godfather or something, this is uh, quite up there. <laughs> in this case, the two parties walking between the cut animals are God and his people, entering into a covenant of all things, a God who made it all, lowering himself and say, let's make a deal. <laughs> just that ought to just, you know, cause some awe. 
There's a relationship, a unique relationship going on. That God is after this with his people. He, this is what he cares most about. Hmm. Because these were a captive people. They were, they were a suffering people for a long time, crying out, crying out. And then it was time. It was God's time. Aslan was on the move. And a stuttering old man stood up and said to the most powerful man on the planet, let my people go, says Yahweh. And the principalities and powers laughed. What a fool. But it was not the last laugh. We know who gets that. When that rock is rolled, we know who's laughing. A messenger was sent with death upon the, the land, bringing death upon the land. We better eat in a hurry. We better, leave your shoes on while you eat. We gotta get out of here quick. That's why they had unleavened bread. They didn't have time to leaven it. Hmm. And the angel of death moved through the land. Everything in the land, every child in the land was executed. The, the young ones, the firstborns, in every house, unless. The angel was going for the heart, unless. Unless he saw blood on the doorpost. Hmm. And then he would just move on, pass over. And the time had come to move, headed for the river headed for the sea. But then our backs were up against that sea. We were kind of trapped. And here came Pharaoh with his army breathing down upon us. Where do we go, Lord? Once again, we're cornered. Once again, we're stuck. Once again, we have no place to go. Once, away there, once more, there's no way out. Have you felt that way in your life? Have you, how many times have you been there? You know, I go through it just, you know, like on a daily basis. <laughs> but the time had come. They were up against, we were up against the mighty river, the mighty sea. But the hand of one mightier was not yet done. A path was made in the sea. Water was parted. Hey, you know, miracles, you either believe in them or you don't. And it doesn't matter how many you see. Remember the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Jesus had done healings, he'd, he'd done exorcisms, he had done, he fed 5,000, he fed 4,000. They said, oh, we'd like to have a sign. <laughs> you just can't fix, stupid, you know. <laughs> the path was made, the water was parted. Uh, it's just nothing for one who designed those things. And his people passed through. Angel of death passed over. The people passed through. And the enemy was swallowed up. Hmm. Sound familiar? Yeah. Exodus, stage left. And so, this night is unlike any other night. We remember the mighty hand of God delivering us, his people. We're part of the story from slavery, from death, from shame, from guilt, from being bound to things that are not life-giving. That's why that this night is not like any other night. And on that night, Jesus took some bread, unleavened bread. He said, this is my body broken for you. This is the deal. It's a covenant meal. I'm the one who gets torn apart in this deal, not you. No man takes my life, I lay it down. My life for yours. And you're no longer your own, you've been bought with a price. You know, dead men don't give the finger when they're stuck in traffic to someone. Yeah, yeah. Dead men don't squawk when they're inconvenienced, right? Dead men don't flip out, you know, when 
things just don't go their way. Why? They're dead. <laughs> uh, greater love has no one than this, but that he lay down his life for his, his, his uh, friend. And he calls us friends. <laughs> you got to just laugh at yourself when you think of that. You're a friend of God. You got to be kidding me. He's not. He's not kidding you. So Jesus took one of the Passover meal cups. There were four. And he said, this is my blood of a new covenant, a new deal. We're going to cut a covenant. The one who gets ripped up is me. The one who dies is me. You get to benefit from the whole thing. I'll keep my end of the deal. My blood, my life offered to you. So drink deeply, for your sins are forgiven. Drink deeply. There's no shame, no blame, and no shame. It's done. It's over. You're free. Drink deeply. Your consciences are cleared so you can have relationships with God and each other. Drink deeply, for you are so dear to our Father in heaven. And the story goes on. We, burdened with sin, are invited into it, to a blood transfusion, if you will. My life for yours. I don't have to do it. I get to do it. That's what's new about the new covenant. When you are overwhelmed with what this God has done for you and me, I want to do it. Whatever he says, I want to do it. That's new. My life for yours until he comes. We live in between those times so loved, so loved. And we will live happily ever after. So as we partake of the blood tonight, may we think on those kinds of things and remember those kinds of things.